Hi, my name is Ray Camden and I'm a developer evangelist for Adobe. Today I'll be talking about the latest release of Cold Fusion, Cold Fusion 10. Now, Cold Fusion 10 has a lot of really cool new features, but I'll have the time to show of a, a few of these today. In general, our features are focused on three main pillars. First of all, if we're going to make it easier to embrace futuristic technologies, things like HTML5, things like WebSockets. Essentially, tomorrow's cutting edge technologies, we're making it very easy for you to start working with them today and have great fallback to support older browsers as well. We're also very focused on having enterprise ready applications, especially with the adoption of the Tomcat J2E uh, server engine within Cold Fusion. It's really primed for the enterprise market. Security has been greatly enhanced. Caching has been enhanced as well. And in general, the enterprise market is going to be very happy with Cold Fusion 10. We're also improving the language to help it make it easier for you to build applications even quicker. Things like closures and other language enhancements now make it even easier to build really stunning applications very quickly. Now again, there's a heck of a lot of new things in Cold Fusion 10. I'm focused on just four main areas today, and let's actually get started. The first feature I want to tell you about are closures. This is a language level feature that other platforms have, and we're baking it into Cold Fusion as well. For my first example, I'm showing how closures can be used within the array sort function to take a set of data and do some custom sorting on it. What you see here is that I've actually written a closure, a function that exists just within array sort itself. Now the logic here can be whatever I want. In this case, I'm basically uh, creating a way to sort my data by age. You can see my array has a couple of different fields, name and age. And then my closure is actually going to sort that just by the name. And if we take a look at this, we can see that, indeed, it did sort people by their age. Now, this function can also take regular functions. Here's an example where I've taken that logic, I've broken it out of a closure, and I actually defined two of them, one called young to old, one called old to young. And I could pass both of these into different calls to array sort. So my first example, I'm doing my youngest oldest, and my second one doing oldest to youngest. And if we look at that, we can see it's definitely sorting the way I want to. Now again, a number-based sort is kind of simple, but you can imagine much more complex sorting can be done within this function very, very easily. In our next example, we actually see that a function can return a new function, a new closure. I actually have a function called operation that based on what you pass to it can create new functions. In this case, we support creating a simple add function and a simple subtract function. You can see on line 14 where I call it, I say return to me the add function, and in the next line, I say return to me the subtract function. So the function itself is actually smart enough to create its own new functions. And if we run this, we'll see that the simple math logic is working pretty easily. Another example of where we support closures is within our arrays and structs. We support an each type format where we could say based on each part of the array or each part of the structure, do something with that data. You see, in my first example here, I have an array of simple values. And all I'm saying is that for each one, I want to run this closure in here and basically just print it out with the BR tag. Pretty simple. In my next one, I'm using a structure. And my closure is passed both the key and the value. Now, for this as well, all I'm doing is simply printing the values out. So by itself, not terribly exciting, but you can see how this could be useful for working with those types of data. One more example, we also support using closures within filtering. If you've ever had an array, a list, or a structure, and you did a real simple way to say, hey, find only certain parts of that data, we now support an array filter, a list filter, and a struct filter function. You can see the examples on screen there where for each one I've done just a random different logic check. So for example, array filter I've said, give me only the items where the value is above 10. Same for the list filter function. And for the struct filter, I got a little bit crazy and said, if the key is age or the value is ray, return it. 
basically whatever business logic you may have on that data, you can write the closure within there to return that information for you. And I'll run this real quick and you can see it's actually doing it. The first two were filtering on values above 10 and the third one had that weird check for the key or the value. As a last example of closures, We've also updated array find. Array find now can support a custom function in there, again, to apply whatever type of logic you want. Now, array find will find the very first item that matches. You can see in my code here, I said if the first letter is Z, return it. In the second example, we have an array find all. Same idea, but it'll return every possible match to that closure. I'll go back in the browser, take a quick look and you can see it's returning those items. So again, that's closures supported at a very deep level and a lot of our functions now support closures as arguments. Let's look at something else new in Cold Fusion 10 and that's charting. We now have HTML5 charts that are very, very easy to use and also very, very powerful. I'm gonna start off by showing you an example of just two basic charts. The first one using the new charting engine the second using the older one. You can see the code is pretty much the exact same. The only change is that in the first one I said format equals HTML. That's telling ColdFusion to use the fancier new HTML5 charting. And by the way, if your browser doesn't support that, guess what? We automatically fall back to Flash without you writing any code to handle that at all. If we take a look at that, you can see both charts rendering. Now they are a bit different, but essentially two different bar charts. Now if all we did was rebuild the existing bar, ch uh, the existing charts wouldn't be that exciting, but we actually have support for a lot of different new types of charts. So for example, we could do a bullet chart. We can do a radar chart. Now if you're like me, you probably have no idea what those are. So let's look at an example of that. And you could see on screen here, some really nice looking charting, and that would be your bullet chart, and that would be your radar chart. So now you know. Simple pie charts work really well, and we also support much more complex attributes. So what you see on screen here is I've specified a very kind of complex background. I don't want just a basic color, I want to actually put a graphic in there. And I can do things like stretching it, filling it, setting the alpha, et cetera. And what I've done here is simply created an implicit struct, kind of JSON type looking, and pass it as the attribute. A lot of our advanced new charting attributes will take these complex structs and allow you to have very, very granular control over the charting. We'll take a look at that. And you can see, there's my lovely background. Again, I put the alpha a bit lower and I can really have some fun with that. One more kind of cool example, how about actually doing updates for charts as well? You can now actually specify a URL in your CF chart tag, and the charting engine is going to ping that URL and get new data. So if we look at this, we'll see, and in this case, it's a very random set of data. But you can see my pie chart is actually updating randomly and you could tweak how quickly it does it and certainly use real information instead. As one more example, and I'll switch to a different browser just to shake it up here a bit. Consider this really, really complex line chart. Now this is supposed to represent an entire year of sales. That's really, really hard to read for a casual user. Well, what this charting engine supports is actually some really, really cool previewing and zooming type features. So for example, I could use this bottom bar here to kind of focus in on one particular area. Or I could even expand that back out and use my mouse to come in here and say, you know what, this low dip here, let's zoom in on that. Now that's a really advanced functionality, but the code for it was really, really simple. I turned on zooming and I turned on previewing. Again, we're trying to make hard things really, really easy for you to use. So for our third feature, I'm going to talk about how we've improved our solar integration. Now, we added solar in ColdVision 9. It's a very powerful full-text search engine. We've actually added a bunch of new features within CF10 related to solar. 
I'm gonna show just one of them, one that I think is, is extremely exciting. It involves tying solar-based searches to ORM. Now, ORM is the way that we've made database type work simpler. It involves our Hibernate support. And what we've done in Cold Fusion 10 is basically married the search engine with the ORM stuff together to make it really simple to use. If we look at my application.cfc file here, you can see where I've enabled ORM. Again, that's something that you've been able to do since Cold Fusion 9. But on lines 6 and 7, what I've also done is enabled search for ORM as well. So those two lines but by themselves are, are, are enough to tell Cold Fusion that we're going to be using this feature. Now here's the really nice part. If we look at one of our entities, to actually say what we're going to index, all I had to do was add a indexable equals true on that first line and then tell Cold Fusion what properties I care to search. You can see here that I've set art name, I want to be indexable, as well as description and price as well. So the same really easy to use CFCs that you know, save us a lot of grunt work in writing SQL queries, we could also use to make our search a heck of a lot easier as well. Now, actually performing the search, well, go over here to a form, all it is is one function, ORM search. I can pass in what I'm searching, what are the entities that I'll be searching against, and what properties. So once I've done that, I can actually come into my browser and do a quick, simple search. and get results. But again, what's nice is that basically once I've told ColdFusion that I want to enable this feature, all the work on updating that solar index is now done by the engine. I don't have to worry about it anymore. I basically turn the feature on, tell it what to search, and I'm done. Now, for the last feature, I'm going to talk about WebSocket support in ColdFusion 10. Now, WebSockets are a very powerful way to allow your browsers to perform network type operations. If you've ever done any type of AJAX-based application where you have to keep the, the front end updated, then you've probably done some type of polling mechanism. You've told your code every minute, every five seconds, whatever. You've told your code to keep hitting the server. Now, that's very inefficient. Your client's doing a lot of network work when it may not need to. WebSockets allows us to actually create kind of a permanent connection between the server and actually all of your clients. Now what's nice is that we've made this really easy to use. Let me show you a quick example of this. Now the first thing I have within my application.cfc file, I'm going to actually define a WebSocket channel. Now you can have as many as you want. In this one I have a simple chat. Within my actual code then, all I really need is a CF WebSocket tag. When I do that, ColdFusion's gonna go ahead and set up all the JavaScript code for me. The only code that I have to write is a code that actually listens for messages and sends messages. The actual mechanics of creating the WebSocket, of doing the network type work, again, ColdFusion's handling all of that for me. Even better, if a browser comes in that does not support WebSockets, guess what? We will do the fallback for you right in the flash. You don't have to worry about it. So what I have here is a really kind of simple, boring chat demo, but everybody does chat demos. I'm gonna do a bit of chatting in one browser and show you what's happening in the other browser. So first I will take Chrome here, and we'll get into the demo, and I'll pick my name as Ray. And I'll say, Ray says, hello world. Okay, right now I'm talking to myself. So I'll go into Firefox, and actually let me make this a little bit bigger. Go into the chat, and we'll put them both on screen here. This will be Bob. And you can see immediately back in Chrome, Chrome saw that Bob entered, and if Bob says hi, the other browser sees it immediately. And again, if we look back at the code, there's very little here. There's the initial creation of that WebSocket, and then there's minimal JavaScript code than the handle actually listening for and sending those messages. As one more example, 
we can actually build a very simple whiteboard. And let me just get my browsers here together so you can see what I'm talking about. What I've done is created a very simple canvas-based application where if I start drawing in Firefox, I see it immediately show up in Chrome. If I go over to Chrome and start drawing, you could see it showed up there as well. And again, the code is very minimal. I tell ColdFusion at the application level what my channels are, and then simply create my code then to handle those messages. So again, I hope that you can see that we have some very exciting stuff coming in ColdFusion 10. I've only showed a few of the many, many new things we're adding. I hope that you're very excited, and thank you for watching.